Hi, I'm Lori Palatnik. I'm the founding director of Momentum. I'm originally from Toronto, but now I live in Jerusalem, Israel. I'm a wife, a mother, a grandmother, an author, and a public speaker. And this is my story. Just tell us a little bit about your upbringing and where were you born? So I was born in Toronto, Canada, and uh, into a Jewish family. I'm one of four kids. And I went to public school, and I knew I was Jewish. And Judaism was not a big part of my life. It was not really a factor in the major decisions I would make in life. Not until I decided to get a backpack and go through Europe. And as I backpacked through Europe, I saw the, I remember being in Paris and going to the Jeux de Palme and floating through the, the greatest French Impressionist collection in the world. And under very strange circumstances, I ended up in Israel. I hadn't planned to come to Israel. We weren't anti-Israel growing up, and maybe when Israel came on the news, we would listen a little bit harder. But Israel wasn't really a, a big part of my life. So coming to Israel, I was very touched and moved by the feelings I had when I came to this country. I didn't understand the feelings. One of the, one of the things was like, oh, everybody's Jewish, the postman's Jewish, the, the bus driver's Jewish. And I grew up in Toronto in a, not a Jewish neighborhood. So something's going on here. Something's happening in this country, and I was very moved by it. The three world religions all converge here. This tiny little country, and the whole world's looking at it. So that sort of was the beginning of my Jewish journey. After backpacking around here for a few weeks, I had a feeling, if I don't leave now, I'm never going to leave. I want to live here forever. But it didn't make any sense. So I left. And that whole year that I was away from Israel, I couldn't get it out of my heart. So I had a chance to go back, so I did. And after studying and touring for six weeks, and having an incredible experience, all those feelings came back. But this time, I understood why. It has something to do with God. It has something to do with the destiny of the Jewish people. And I wanted to be part of it. So I stayed for a year. And I ended up meeting my husband. He's from America. He's, he's Chica from Chicago. We actually bought our home here in Jerusalem uh, nine years ago. Uh, because our, our kids, we have five kids, and they started coming here for gap years, and, and our son served in the IDF as a lone soldier. We really feel like we're living the dream. Describe your journey adapting to life here in Israel. Was it challenging, or was it a smooth transition? Even though like we're Jewish, and uh, you know, the, we're living in the Jewish part of Jerusalem, it's, uh, it's a different world. First of all, it's the Middle East. It is, it is a different culture. Israelis are a different breed. They're also, they're tough. They're tough. They have to be tough and resilient because it's not easy. You're living in not an easy neighborhood here. So I'm slowly, slowly trying to adapt and learn the language. My husband, he learned it many, many years ago when he was on kibbutz. Otherwise, we're really coming to Israel. Listen, if five minutes ago or 74 years ago, it was, we're, there's still draining swamps here and there was a lot of strife. We're coming at a time where we're, we're on the shoulders of people who gave their lives for this country. So it's, now it's startup nation. The joke is like the, the national bird is a crane. It, it, it's, it's the construction crane, because it's just the place is booming and you have all the technology and you have all the advantages and you're living, especially in Jerusalem, there's a lot of old and there's a lot of new. And it's really, we're, it's a very exciting time to be here. How did you begin Momentum and what inspired you to create this? Organization. In the Jewish world, in terms of um, public speakers, there's a lot of men. And I think that goes in a many cultures. It's very male dominated. I feel like God gave me a gift for communication and I started teaching locally in Toronto. And then somebody invited me to another city. I think it was St. Louis was the first city I went to to speak. And then it kind of took off. And I know that when I was starting my Jewish journey, I needed female role models. I needed to hear wisdom from a female perspective. I wanted to ask my questions about, especially like women's role in Judaism, not from a man. So I sort of became uh, a little bit popular as a speaker in Jewish communities. But as I was speaking around the world, I saw that Jewish communities were going in the wrong direction. They were not, they were not getting stronger, they were getting weaker, but I knew that the key to a strong community is the women. And I remember thinking like, if you would just give me your women, I could help you. I could turn this around. So I went back. I was living in the Washington DC area in Rockville, Maryland. And I gathered seven other women who I knew. The only thing they had in common is they all knew me. And four ideas rose to the top. This idea, this idea of taking Jewish mothers, we knew from 
very early on in the process that we wanted to target Jewish, Jewish women. Why? Not just because we were women. Because it's strategically smart. If I get the mom, I get the family. The mother holds the three most important keys that will affect the family now and for generations to come. Where we live, where our kids go to school, and who we socialize with. And we sort of like put it out there to see like, does anything have traction? And this one took off like a rocket. I've never been involved in anything that took off. Everyone's like, you're right, it's the mother. Where have we been? Under the umbrella of the Jewish mother, we were able to bring organizations together that normally never work together. The first year, we, we wanted to have a, a one-year program that starts with eight days in Israel. You come out of a class here, a lecture here, and you're walking the streets where Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah walked. Like, the history, the stones could just talk. The first year we brought 300 women, then we brought 600, then we brought 900, and then Israel's Ministry of Diaspora Affairs called us. Who are you? What are you doing? We want to talk to you. I, I went, went in and I passionately presented, and we have data that shows that this is a game changer, that if you influence the mother, she will influence the family. So. They said, double your numbers, get into Eastern Europe, and we'll help back you. So I flew to, because we were really focusing mostly on North America at the time. So I flew to Moscow, and I flew to Hungary, and I flew to Germany. And, and now we've brought over 20,000 participants from 34 countries. I don't know if this is the home run for the Jewish people, but I do believe it's my personal home run. And I really feel privileged to be part of it. What role does Israel play in these momentum trips? So when they come to Israel, it used to be that Israel was the one value or the one thing that Jews, no matter where they are, left, right, you know, religious, not religious, that we could all agree on. But recently that's, that's over. Israel's become a controversial value and subject even amongst the Jews, especially in North America. And we don't whitewash the country. We don't say this is a perfect country. We don't hide the challenges, but we also highlight the beauty. That look at Jews of all shapes, sizes, and colors, and political spectrum. We're, they're coming back from the four corners of the earth, which is really the fulfillment of a prophecy. Who would have thought? Think about our parents and our grandparents, for sure, our grandparents. If you would have told my grandparents, who came from Russia and Poland to Canada to start a life, fleeing the pogroms, if you would have said, just wait. Wait, Bobby and Zadie, there's going to be a Jewish state. And this is the first time in history that no Jew is trapped in a country. It's amazing. It's miraculous. Judaism is not a religion. We're a family, a highly dysfunctional family. How many women and families would you say your organization has helped move back to the homeland? Even though one of our goals is to engage with Israel, we don't push Aliyah. We don't push the idea of moving back to Israel. But, of course, it's so easy to fall in love with this country. I know personally close to 40 families. Like, I thought it was 30, and then I start getting more. Like, every, a month doesn't go by that somebody doesn't tell me, like, oh, I was on the trip in 2000 and, you know, fill in the blank. And we've decided to move to Israel. That is something we hadn't planned, but has been an outgrowth of what we do. What happens in the eight days that... It's okay. In the eight-day trip of the Momentum trip, what are some of the things that you, events that you guys organize? In the eight days, every day has a theme because every day has a value. And we chose values that we feel really resonate with all of the women, no matter what country they're coming from. But on the trip, we, we pamper them and we take care of them because back home, they're taking care of everybody else. And we make sure we take care of their physical needs and their emotional needs and their, and their spiritual needs. And we open up a world of possibilities for them. So somebody will come up to me after my marriage talk and say like, I think you just saved my marriage. And I tell them, I didn't save your marriage. Your Torah saved your marriage. This is your wisdom. I'm just given the privilege to unlock this wisdom presented to, to you in a way that you can hear it. Jews don't leave Judaism because of what they know, it's because of what they don't know. And Jews don't turn their back on Israel because of what they know, it's because of what they don't know. So it's no longer let my people go. Now it's let my people know. The former Prime Minister Bennett was quoted saying that your organization is the single most effective program in the Jewish world. That's a huge compliment. 
How does that make you feel? And what do you think makes your organization the most effective? It's really beautiful that former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett spoke so highly of our organization. And he knows us and he knows our organization because he was the Minister of Diaspora Affairs when we began our partnership with the Israeli government. He says he sits on the, the, the board of Birthright and he believes in Birthright and so do I. But he says there's a greater JROI, a Jewish return on your investment with momentum. Why? You get the mom, you get the family. And I'm so, so grateful to him, so grateful to him. Uh, the new prime minister, interestingly, is Prime Minister Lapid. We'll see how long, you know, in Israel, like we have elections often. And his wife, Lihi, the, now the first lady, sits on, the board, sits on our public council. We have an Israel public council. Uh, very diverse women from the left to the right and because of the work we're doing here in Israel to help guide us to, to impact society here. So I'm so, so grateful to be connected to these incredible people who are devoted to this country and to the Jewish people. Currently you live in Jerusalem where Palestinians in neighborhoods like Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan are facing eviction by the Israeli government. As someone who is part of an organization that encourages Jewish people and Jewish converts to reconnect to this land. How do you feel about this issue, given that it's caused a massive outrage globally last year? You know, if somebody uh, was in a coma for five years and came out of the coma, and they said there's problems in the Middle East, there's strife between the Arabs and the Jews, like, hello, it's not something that's just recent. Many years ago, I was sitting in my pediatrician's office in Toronto, and I was holding my child who was sick, and there was an there was clearly an Arab woman across from me, um, and she was also holding her child, and her child was sick. And I remember thinking, we just want the same things. We, ju we just want our children to be healthy and happy. And it really struck me. A lot of the strife that happens, a lot of it's political, and I have to say, in my personal opinion, it's patriarchal. Men have very big egos that drive them to success, but it's the boulder they trip over. And when you have power and you have money and it feeds into a person's ego, it's, they're not always thinking for the greater good. And I do believe, I am a, a, an unbelievable optimist, that if there is going to be peace, harmony, and again, we don't have to be the same. If we could live side by side, it's only going to be realized by women. In general, Women are more conciliatory. Women see the bigger picture. Women look at their family and they see the needs of the individuals in the family. And I like to be part of it. I always say, I don't know if I can solve the problem, but I want to be part of the solution. I'm trying to learn about Israeli society and we're spending different Shabbats and, and different times in different, different parts of Israel to understand like this community, that community, this sector, that sector, this political stream, this, but I'm doing kind of research now I, I'm starting to get it, and I'm starting to see, maybe because I'm coming in objectively with no political agenda and not growing up here, because sometimes when you're inside something, you can't see it. I'm going to need the help of different types of people here in Israel. It, things that I learned with momentum, I believe some of it can be applied here, especially harnessing the power of women. During last year's war, there was global support for Palestine to be free and become its own independent state. As an Israeli, how does that make you if giving land to your neighbor would create peace, then give land. If creating two countries that could live side by side in separate states would bring peace, then let's do it. I just don't believe that's necessarily going to bring peace. Some people say, yes, they want peace, but peace by peace. If in, their doc if in somebody's doctrine and in the teachings that they teach their children is to hate and that driving one nation into the sea is the solution, then giving land or creating another country is not going to solve that. If we could only teach that harmony, if we could only teach that we could live side by side, that we could have a wonderful life living together, all these political declarations and people voting for this and vote that, and the problem is you can vote this or you vote that. Like in 1948, they voted to give, the United Nations voted to give, to create a Jewish state, which was, also, the Balfour Declaration, like 50 years early, it was the same thing. Some countries didn't agree, and they attacked. Like, what, what's going on? Like, we could have lived side by side right then. So what do you do when somebody attacks you? You have to defend yourself. You do. These are your children. I don't have all the solutions, but I do have a desire to 
have a different, that we could have a different life. And I believe it does start with teaching our children not to hate, but to love. What are some misconceptions about Israel that you feel are important to address? First of all, they think like, we're just at war all the time, okay? So I think that the people who are filming me see like, you know, there's cafes and theater and, and sports and beach. I told my mother, if I, if, if I just only watched the news in Toronto, I'd be afraid, okay? Because they're only telling you about the crime and the things that are going on. When you're living your life here every day, it's amazing. Bombs are not falling here. There are times where things get tense. But just like any city, there are certain neighborhoods. Be careful when you go to that neighborhood. I'm more worried. I'd be more worried if my kid lived in New York. My, I had two married daughters. When they started off their life, they were living in New York. I was more afraid of them living in New York than my kids who were living in Israel. Another one is you hear this idea that we're an apartheid state. If you go into just a, a few hundred meters from here is a, a mall. It's called Manila Mall. It's like an outdoor mall. It's a high-end mall. You see like Arabs shopping and walking safely there. But if I'm renting a car and I turn into the wrong city and I end up in an Arab city, I literally am taking my life into my hands. But if an Arab turns, makes a wrong turn and turns into a Jewish city, they're gonna help you. <laughs> they're gonna, like, what? oh, you're in the wrong city? Like, here's the directions. Like, can I get you something to drink? It's, n it's not what you hear and it's not what you see on the news. So I. I urge you to come and to see and to be part of the solution and not the problem. It's an amazing country. What do you hope to see in the future of Israel and the people who are currently living here? The Jewish people had two temples. Uh, it's called the Beit HaMikdash. And they, what you see, you know, when you go to the Western Wall and you see the Gold Dome there, well, the Gold Dome wasn't there. There were two huge temples. And one was destroyed by the Romans and one by the Babylonians. After that, the Jews were dispersed. Um, throughout the world. It was not destroyed because we didn't keep kosher or Shabbat. It was destroyed because of something called sinat chinam, senseless hatred. But there was hatred between Jews. So God looks down and sees his children. And if they're like, if they hate each other, it's not why he created us. And that's why the temple was destroyed not just because we had an enemy army, because God's protection fell, because we weren't being the people we're supposed to be. So what's gonna bring us back? What's the opposite of senseless hatred? Love with a purpose. I've lived in many Jewish communities in North America, and I travel all over the world to communities. Out there, Jews don't hate each other. They don't like each other, they compete against each other, they speak badly about each other, but they don't hate each other. If they say like, oh, I hate him or I hate her, it's just an expression. In Israel, it's not an expression. There are groups of Jews in Israel who hate other groups of Jews because of politics, because of religion, because of fill in the blank. This is where the solution has to be. This is where, if the Jewish people are going to be that light unto the nations, to be a moral beacon to the world, the work has to happen here. We have to repair this very broken family. It will emanate through the world to be, to fulfill our mission in the world. And then all boats will rise. Okay. Thank you.